Well, thank you very, very much, and good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I want to tell you, it is a joy to be with you today. Of course, if you know anything about preachers, they're just pretty much glad to be anywhere. But I am glad to be with you. Let me, first of all, say something about the name of the church. Now, the name of the church, it didn't make it up. It came from a street name years ago, but it's called Idlewild Baptist Church. Now, let me just say this. That's two names you don't want in any Baptist church, and I've got them both, Idle and Wild, but that is really the name. Call us Lazy Crazy Baptist Church if you want to, but it's Idlewild Baptist Church, and it's been my joy and privilege to be here, and I've been the pastor uh, for 32 years, and, uh, and so I want you to know what a privilege it is and really an honor to take God's word, open it up, and to talk to you today about something very, very important, and that is our families, but really more important than that, our heart. So I invite you if you have God's word, because the best kind of counseling is always going to come, and really the only biblical counseling is going to come, not from what we know or what we think we know, but from God's word. So I invite you if you would, to take your Bibles to the first book in the Bible, the book of Genesis, and go to chapter 32, because I'll meet you there in just a few moments. Genesis 32, because I want to talk to you about a man, because we're talking about being conquered, and we're talking about conquering. I want to tell you what A.W. Tozer said years ago. Tozer said that the Lord cannot fully bless a man until he has first conquered him. So I, here's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about how God changes and how God changes, and here it is, you ready? How God changes dysfunction to unction. Now, of course, there, for there to be unction, there needs to be function. So what God does is going to take us from dysfunction. Can I just say this? I know we think that we've invented that word and last 15, 20 years, no one was really talking about the word dysfunction, but can I tell you that uh, if you study the Bible, their dysfunction has been in the Word of God forever, and uh, I want to talk to you today about a man that his name is Jacob, and I want to tell you how God changed him, because how God changed him is how God wants to change you and how God wants to change me. Now, before we begin, before we jump into our text, and before I talk about this dysfunctional man by the name of Jacob, let's talk a little bit about you and I, because there is a Jacob inside of every one of us. Now, how do I know that? Well, Re Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us that. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And that word, desperately wicked, and that word deceitful, the word deceitful, our hearts are a Jacob. That's really what that word is. We are deceitful. We have a Jacob inside of us. But here's the good news about the gospel. The gospel changes us. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. But here's what you need to understand. Christianity, yes, it is subtraction. And it is taking away our sins. And it is addition. It is the Lord Jesus coming by his spirit, filling us and coming to live within us forever. But, but let me tell you something. There's some things that he does not take away. And what he does not take away, we battle and we struggle. And that is the very life in which we have lived all of our days. So I, I want you to see this chart. First of all, it's, uh, it's chart A there, Glenn, and here's, here's what I want you to see. I, I want you to see something here, and I want to show you an iceberg, all right? We're talking about how God changes dysfunction to unction, and we, I want you to see this iceberg. And here's what I want you to understand before we jump into our text and we study this, this Bible character of Jacob, because we'll come back to this chart, and we're going to look at another one in just, in just a moment. Understand that God made you because he made us in the image of God. So it's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, right? When your body's right, you're healthy. When your soul is right, you're happy. And when your spirit is right, you're holy. So there are three of you actually on this Zoom today. There are three of you watching online. You have a body, you have a soul, and you have a spirit. Your soul uh, is that you can feel, you can think, and you can act. That's what your soul is. So when your body's right, you're healthy. 
when your soul's right, you're happy. But when your soul, when your spirit is right, you're holy. So God made us with a body and with a soul and with our spirit. And we're going to talk about family and we're going to talk about counseling. And here's what I want you to understand. When you are talking to a person about their own life, and by the way, the best counselors are the ones who understand themselves the best and understand biblically how God's made them, created them, fashioned them, formed them, and even changed them. You remember what Jesus said to Simon Peter when he said, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my lambs, Peter. And what he was saying is, Peter, no one's going to be a better shepherd than the one who's wandered from the shepherd himself. And therefore, when you know yourself, you're going to be able to know others. But you need to understand something. When someone comes into your office and they talk to you, you're going to see the top part of that iceberg, and you're not going to see the bottom part. They tell me that in an iceberg, that 90% of the iceberg is invisible. Everything below that green line is what I want you to see is invisible. You can just write invisible because those are things you don't know. You don't know about their beliefs. You don't know about their image. You don't really know about their pain. And 10% is what you see. You see their soul. And sometimes we think of counseling and we think of the Bible that, you know, if you just give them more Bible and, and here's what I think sometimes we even almost the way we approach life when we're talking to people. And by the way, I'm not talking about just sitting down with somebody and pouring out your heart and counseling. I'm talking about discipleship. I'm talking about spending time with someone. I'm talking about understanding who they are. And we're going to look at Jacob in just a few moments and look at who he is. And you see, you're going to see Jacob's behavior. You're going to see what he believes and you're going to see what he feels. So when you and I are talking, if you came in to see me and said, Pastor Ken, I want to talk to you about something. I would listen to you. I would, first of all, be able to detect your emotions. I'd be able to detect your behavior. Now, I may not know totally what you believe, but you might even tell me what you believe. You know, in the counseling world, we lost a great counselor in the last few, uh, in the last week or so. His name was Dr. Larry Crabb, and I don't know if you know him or not, but he's written the book, Change Inside Out. He's written several books, actually. He said that a man walked into his office one time and said, um, well, Dr. Crabb, I need some help. And he said, well, all right, what can I do for you? And he always starts off with that line. What can I do for you? And here's what the man said. He said, well, uh, I'd like to feel better. I'd like to feel better fast. And um, I think that's enough to get us started. Dr. Crabb said, so let me see if I got this right. You came in here. You'd like to feel better. Yes. And you'd like to feel better fast. He said, yeah, that's about it. That's about it. He said, all right, I have a suggestion for you. He said, wow, already? He said, oh, of course. He said, what's your suggestion? He said, well, if I were you, I would get me some available women, get me my favorite alcoholic beverage, and I'd go to the Bahamas. And the man sat back and looked at Dr. Crabb, and he said, Dr. Crabb, are you a Christian counselor? He said, of course. He said, well, that just doesn't sound very Christian to me. And Dr. Larry Crabb said, here's what you need to understand, sir. You weren't asking for Christian counsel. Here's what you said. You want to feel good and you want to feel good quick. And he said, if that's your goal in life, you probably do not want to try Jesus Christ because it doesn't always work fast and quick with him. Isn't that true? Now, here's what we see that we do not see. Here's some things underneath the waterline. We've grown up in our life with some pain, and that pain has built some image. We're made in the image, and we're image bearers. And sometimes we don't always come across, but there's an image that's always involved in that. And then there's a belief. There's a belief. Now, here's what you need to understand. When the belief below the waterline conflicts with the belief above the waterline, here's what you need to understand. You've got conflict. You have got a crisis and a conflict when the belief below the waterline of what you really believe. You see, we, can I tell you this? We practice what we believe. The rest is just religious talk. So as we begin to look today in the, in the life of Jacob, let me show you another chart, B. Now you've seen the behavior and the beliefs. I, I want you to just think of, of this iceberg in four 
patterns here. I want you to see that when someone comes in to talk to you, even when you approach a Bible character sometimes, without really understanding some things about their life, you will see a surface problem. But if you just address the surface problem, you haven't really helped them. Now, sometimes here's what we've actually acted like in the church. We've said, now, listen, I can help you with your anger and I can help you with uh, the, your sinful patterns and problems in your life. But now if you've got some real deep problems, you need to go see somebody professional. Listen to me, listen to me. You know what you're communicating? You're communicating that the Bible and God's word is not sufficient for anything deep. That somebody else has to be able to talk about those things in their life. But you see, the Bible is not just a list of rules and regulations. The Bible is a book of relationships. God formed us. He made us body, soul, and spirit. So when I'm talking to someone, I'm going to try to find the surface problem that's going on in their life. And then I'm going to see the struggling pain that's going on in their life. And then I also know this, the top of the water line, there's going to be some sinful practice. And then at the bottom of that water line, there's going to be a self-protection that becomes sinful as well, but it's self-protection. Now, listen to me. If all I deal with is above the water line and I deal with the surface problem and the sinful practice, then I might give them shallow counseling to help them understand, but I haven't really got to change. Now, here's what you need to understand. There is no change spiritually, relationship relationally or biblically, there is no change without repentance. Repentance is a change of mind, but it's also a change of action. It's going one way and all of a sudden realizing I need to go another way. So here, here's what I want us to do. I want us to think about that surface problem. We'll come back and struggling pain and sinful practice and self-protection. And I want us to see that pain and that image and that belief below the waterline that you've written down on those notes but why don't we do this? Why don't we take a look at God's word and let's look at the, the, the character by the name of Jacob. Because can I tell you something? If you looked up the word dysfunction, his picture would be right there in the dictionary. It'd be right there in the Bible because nobody came from a more dysfunctional place in life than Jacob. He was a cheat. And you can't cheat a cheat. You can't con a con and you can't kid a kid. But God did something to Jacob. God took Jacob from lying and from leaning and from to limping to leaning. He took him from lying to limping to leaning. And that's what God wants to do with all of our hearts. But he only did that as he began to really understand who he was. So I'm in Genesis 32. And, uh, and, and I want you to look with me at a passage of scripture in verse 24. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not defeat him, he struck Jacob's hip as they wrestled, and he dislocated his hip socket. And he said to Jacob, let me go, for it is daybreak. And Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. What is your name? The man said. Now, watch this. He's wrestling with a man. It's the God man. It's the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And he asked him the question, what is your name? Jacob, he replied, verse 28, your name will no longer be called Jacob, he said. It will be Israel because you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. And Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. He answered, why do you ask my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called that place Peniel, for he said, I've seen God face to face and I've been delivered. The sun shone him as he passed by Penuel, limping on his hip. And that's why to this day, the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that's at the hip socket because he struck Jacob's hip socket at his thigh muscle. Hey, I told you that Jacob came from a very, very dysfunctional family, and he did. First of all, let me tell you what we know about Jacob. He had a prejudiced father. You know, the Bible actually says that Isaac loved Esau better than Jacob, and then tells us why. Because he did eat of his venison. What's that mean? Well, you know exactly what that means. Jacob was a mama's boy. Jacob was a great cook. And don't slight that. Some of the greatest cooks in the world were men. And so Jacob was a great cook. But Esau was a hunter. Now, you know the story of Jacob and Esau. They were born tw twins. 
And you know that, that Esau actually came out first. He was the firstborn. And that means something to that family because if you're the firstborn, you get the rights of the firstborn. You are the progenitor. You are the person that gets the blessing from the father of the firstborn. You get three-fourths of everything being the firstborn. The Bible says that when Jacob came out of the womb with Esau, he came grabbing by his heel, and his name, they called him Jacob. Hosea, even chapter 12, talks about Jacob. Laban even said, he cheated me twice. Has he not been called Jacob? Well, right. In other words, Jacob means cheat, liar, supplanter, conniver, twister, one that grabs you by the heel. That's Jacob. He had a prejudiced father because Esau was a hunter and Jacob was not a hunter. Let me ask you this. If you're counseling with Jacob, you think maybe there's some things going on underneath the waterline. When you're counseling Jacob, do you think maybe there's some surface problems? That there's some conflicts that he has? Do you know anything about Jacob? He's got conflicts every time he turns around. He's deceitful in his behavior. He's manipulator. He's a conniver. He's not loved by his father. He struggles with his masculinity. And so he comes with a prejudiced father. But can I tell you something? He had a protecting mother. Did you know his mother wouldn't even let him date till he was 40 years old? <laughs> no, he couldn't. He, 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 he hung around his mom. In fact, his mom even helped him cheat his dad when he stole the birthright from his brother Esau. I mean, we're talking big time problems here. So here's a man trying to escape his pain. And when we find him in Genesis 24, here's what you need to know. He's been running from God for 20 years, and he's been running from Esau for 20 years. Isaac, his father, dies, and he says, his brother Esau said, when my dad dies, I'm coming after you, and I'm going to kill you because he stole his birthright. Now, here's what we know. He's got a prejudiced father. He's got a protecting mother, but watch this. He's got a profane brother. That word profane, it means without enclosures. Hebrews 12 talks about it, doesn't it? And it says that Esau sold his birthright for a pot of stew. In other words, to Esau, birthright meant nothing. And without enclosure means whatever is for up for grabs, I'll give it to you if you want it. He wasn't interested in spiritual things. Now, let me tell you something. Everybody hated Jacob. Because Jacob was a cheat. But can I tell you something? Jacob hated Jacob. And there is a surface problem going on in his life. And he doesn't recognize his problem. Jacob has two wives. He has two handmaids. Zilpah and Bildah. Now, can I just tell you something? When you read the Bible and you hear about two wives and two uh, handmaidens and you know that he's had physical relationships and intimate relationships, here's what you got to know. You have to make a distinction in the Bible between what God reports and what God supports because everything that God reports, he doesn't support. I mean, we do good to keep one happy, right? And then keep us happy. And for us to be married the way God purposed when he created marriage. This was not God's plan, but that's what Jacob did. So let me ask you, does he have some surface problems? He was cheated by his father-in-law, Laban. He changed his wages 10 times. He's a cheat. He's got a disappointing marriage. He's got surface problems. Let me ask you this. You think he's got a struggling pain? You think maybe he struggles with rejection? You think he struggles with being a victim? You think maybe he struggles with that God is against him? He, he had to work seven years for Rachel, and then at the time he thought he was going to marry her, he married Leah because Laban substituted. And I don't know how that happens, by the way, but all of a sudden he has to work seven more years for Rachel, and he works 14 years. So when you look at his life and he comes into you for counseling, we see sadness and guilt. He feels betrayed. He's immoral. He doesn't feel like a man. 
He's at war with everyone. He's at war with God. He's at war with Esau. He's at war with Laban. He's at war with his wives. He's at war with himself. And he's missed a blessing. Even though he got the blessing, he never really feel like he got it. He had to cheat to get it. What is it that he's not getting? You think maybe he's not getting a blessing from his dad? Of course. You think he's not getting respect from his brother? Of course. What's the purpose in his pain? Remember when I told you there's in there, at the bottom there's pain that builds an image? What's his image? What's his belief? You see, until you understand what his pain is and his image and you understand what his belief is below the waterline, you'll never be able to help him what he really should be believing and what God's word says. So what does God do? Well, let me give you three things here. The first thing God does and he does in your life and my life when he wants to take this function and turn it into function and unction is he brings a crisis. Write that down, crisis. You know, a carnal man always likes to stay busy. He surrounds himself with noise and friends and music and toys. And, 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 and listen, the Bible says in Genesis, in chapter 32 and verse 24, Jacob was left alone. Circle that, alone. And he's at Jabok. It, it's, it's like the Holy Spirit pouring out a word for us and giving us, Jabok means pouring out. Here is Jacob, who is alone. Locationally, he's alone. Logistically, he's alone. Lovingly, he's alone. I wonder today if I'm speaking to anybody today that just feels alone. God's trying to change the Jacob in you and turn you into an Israel. But before he can bless you, Tozer says he must conquer you. And Jacob was always the one winning, but he didn't like himself when he won. And so God brings him to a place of isolation. God brings him to a place of confrontation. The Bible says that God starts wrestling with Jacob. Now listen to me. God started this fight. Jacob did. Jacob's minding his own business. When a man jumps on him, the Bible says. Now who is that man? Well, don't get the idea that Jesus just appeared in Matthew and in Luke. Why? why? He's the God man. He's the fourth man in the fiery furnace. He's the one that appeared to Abraham. He, he's Jehovah God, and, and sometimes he appears as a man, and he does in Genesis 32, and he jumps on him. Now, now, listen, Jacob doesn't know who he is. In fact, who do you think Jacob thinks this is? Well, of course, he thinks it's Esau, and he jumps on him. You know what the prophets of old used to teach? They used to teach, the teachers of old, that it was his guardian angel that jumped on him. This isn't just an angel. This is God jumping on him. But I want to ask you a question. How obnoxious do you have to be for your angel, guardian angel, to jump on you? <laughs> well, I've got a guardian angel, and I'm telling you, he, when, he, when I get to glory, he's going to say, oh, God, thank you, he's home. But he, won't, he wouldn't jump on me, but he jumps on him, and he confronts him. And you know what Jacob does? He does what we do. He tried to throw the blessing off. Can I ask you a question? What is it today that could be the greatest blessing in your life that you're trying to throw off? Because we don't know the difference between trash and treasure, do we? And so God jumps on Jacob. And Jacob's got this surface problem and Jacob's got this struggling pain. But let me tell you something. Jacob's got this sinful practice. He's cheated people. He's lied to people. He's ran from his problems. Only by pride comes conflict, so we know he's got some pride, and he's got jealousy, and he's got manipulation problems, and he's self-willed. Jacob needs a touch from God, so God brings him to a crisis in his life, and he, and, and he brings him to a place of isolation, a place of confrontation, a place of what we call desperation, but then listen. The second thing I want you to see when God wants to change us from a dysfunction to unction is not just crisis, but he does it with commitment. What do I mean by commitment? Well, follow the story. The man jumps on him and the man says, turn me loose. 
Now listen, folks, that fight's fixed, all right? What angel could not whip a man? He's saying, turn me loose. And underneath his breath, he's saying, I hope you don't. I hope you don't. And what he's wanting to know is a commitment. And you know what Jacob said? I will not turn you loose till you bless me. What did he want? He wanted a blessing. He wanted a blessing from God. I'm not giving up. And sometimes when families are in crisis and sometimes when God's confronting families and even in your life today, you know what God's just wanting to see? He's wanting to see, I hope you don't turn me loose. I hope you'll stay with me until I conquer you because you'll never conquer, Tozer said, until you're first conquered. Do you remember that Syrophoenician woman in Matthew 15 and Mark 7? Do you remember when Jesus said, and she said, I've, I've got a daughter uh, that's vexed with the devil and can you do something? And he said to her, do you think I'm going to give the children's bread and give it to dogs? What? Did you hear that? Jesus called her a dog? And that word dog there, it, 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 it means household pet. You know what she said? She said, I know I'm a woman and I know I'm Jewish and I know I have no right to the Messiah, but even the kids, the children get crumbs that fall from the table. And even the dogs, when the kids drop the crumbs, even the dogs, and the word she uses is yellow mangy back alley dogs. She said, I know who I am. I'm a yellow black back alley dog to you. You're a man, I'm a woman, you're Jewish, I'm not. I'm a Syrophoenician. And Jesus looked at her and said, you know what, woman, I've never seen such great faith in all of my life. Go home, your daughter's healed. You know all he wanted to do? He wanted to make sure that she just committed. Most of the time we're saying, God, would you bless me? But if you don't, don't worry about it, it's no problem. Let me tell you something about Jacob. Jacob didn't like Jacob. Jacob had a, uh, a service problem and a struggling pain, and he had a sinful practice in his life. But there was something inside of Jacob that was a, a self-protection. He, he never wanted to face his pain. He lied. He cheated. But everything inside of him longed for the same thing you and I longed for. He wanted to be blessed by God. So what's God do? Well, he brings us to a crisis. Then he brings us to a confrontation. And then I want you to see something else. He brings us to a confession. Now listen to me. In any counseling, repentance comes with a confession of who you really are. Now watch what happens here. God says, what is your name? Wait a minute. You pounce on a man, God, and you wrestle with him all night long and you don't even know his name? What kind of God are you? No, 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 no. No, he knew him. Listen to me. You ready? Write this down. In order for you to just stop defeating yourself, you've got to stop deceiving yourself. In order for you to stop defeating yourself, you have to stop deceiving yourself. What's your name? If I ask you today, what's your name? What would you say? What's your name? Liar, cheat, lust, anger. What is it? Listen to me. Until your pain becomes greater than your fear of change, you will never change. Can I say that again? Until your pain becomes greater than your fear of change, you will never change. What's your name? He said, my name's Jacob, as if to say, are you happy? My name is supplanter, liar, twister, conniver, one that grabs you by the heels. That's who I am. And he said, no, no, that's not who you are. You see, when you come to the place where you understand that your pain builds an image and your image builds a belief system below the waterline, you're ready to start believing what God believes about you. And God said, no, no, no. You shall no longer be called Jacob. You shall be called Israel, son of my right hand. And he changed him. And he took him from dysfunction to function. So what's God doing here? 
What is God wanting here? God is wanting us to understand something very, very powerful. God's wanting you and I to see something. And if it got a little dark here, it's because we just lost power. See, the enemy hates these kind of sermons. He hates these kind of stories. So you just hang in there with me. If you can see me or hear me, that's okay. I'm, I'm not much to look at. But let me tell you, if you can just hear me, I'm coming to a wrap up and we'll have and maybe this power will come back on. But let me just say this. Listen to me well. When God, when a crisis doesn't work, a confrontation will. But God's after the confession. And when God gets to the confession, God will get you to the place where there's change. What's God after? God's after change. Because until you stop deceiving yourself, you'll never stop defeating yourself. And until your pain becomes greater than your fear of change, you'll never change. So go back and, and, and look at B again, that chart, B. And just look with me at something. I want you to see there's a surface problem that he had. There's a struggling pain that he had. There's a sinful practice that he had. And there's a self-protection that he had. And God began to expose this selfful practice. His, his wanting to control. His, he, he was passive. He was self-protective. Nobody's going to hurt me. I got hurt before. I'll never get hurt again. And you see, it wasn't until he ran into God that God changed him. And you know what? Jacob walked away with a limp. But the Bible says that that blessing he was looking for, he got. So take away that chart and look at me one more time. Let me just close. And then we'll take some questions. I want you to imagine something with me. Jacob goes home and he sees his wife. And she and he is a mess. I mean, he's been wrestling all night long. And his hair is tousled and he's got dirt all over his clothes. They're ripped to shreds. He's been wrestling with God. You know what's great about this story? He not only wrestled with God, but he was conquered. And when he was conquered, he actually won. John Calvin said that God fights against us with his left hand while he fights for us with his right hand. And you know what F.B. Meyer said about Genesis 32 and Jacob? He said that he began to clean where once he struggled. He began to clean. And he said, I will not turn you loose till you bless me. So he comes home and his wife says, what happened? What happened to you? And imagine Jacob looking at his wife. He's limping. And he says, oh, I got blessed. <laughs> I got blessed. And she says, what? He goes, no, I got blessed. Jacob had that limp the rest of his life. And the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that he leaned upon his staff and he died. Now, that doesn't mean, pastors, that, that when you lean upon your staff that you're going to die. That's not what that means. What that means is that he had leaned against that crutch, and he went from lying to limping to leaning. And that's where God wants us, because God wants to take dysfunction and turn it into unction and turn it into function for your life. And there's a lot about counseling here, and we're not going to cover it in a sermon in 30 minutes. But you might have some questions that we can talk about and that we can deal with. And so, Glenn, I'm going to turn this back over to you. But I want to tell you what a blessing it's been to be. Take God's word and open it. Hope you've been blessed. Hope you've seen that God uses a crisis. He uses confrontation. But he uses confession to us to get to the place where we admit, I'm a Jacob. I really am a Jacob. And we come to grip with that pain so that God can heal that pain in our lives. Father, thank you in Jesus' name for the word of God. Thank you for the change that we can have when we are met with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Conquer us so we can be conquering men and women, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said together, amen and amen. That is a great question. And, and of course, all of us, 
have a story. And let me just say this, if our, if our life was birthed in a bubble, that would be great, but it's not. It was birthed in a battle. And all of us have these battles that we have in our life. And, and let me just say this to you, that when relieving pain is our number one priority, we have left the path of pursuing God. Can I say that again? When the number one, when relieving pain is our number one priority, then we have left the path of pursuing God. God pursues us in pain. God brings us to pain. And, and in my life began, it was, I, was, I was married and had kids when I began to realize how much of a Jacob that I really was. I, I, was, a, I, was, a, I was a kid that grew up, um, and if you looked above the waterline for me, you would see a kid that battled self-esteem issues. I battled fear. I was a pretender. I battled shame. I battled uh, pride and stubbornness. And those were problems in my life. And, and, and I had the, the pain in my life. And the struggling pain was that I battled guilt and shame. And I, I felt alone. I was the baby in my family. And, and somehow I, I felt like even God loved me, but I, I didn't know if he liked me. And so this is even as a, in the ministry, I'm in the ministry preaching to people and I'm preaching the top of the waterline sermons where, and I'm telling them how they can change. But I knew that what God wanted to do is do something deep within my life. And God began to show me inside how my self-protection was violating love because hurt people hurt people. And because if you've been hurt, uh, you know, a cat sits on a hot stove, Mark Twain said, it will never sit on a hot stove. He'll never sit on a cold stove either. He's just not going to take the chance. And when you've been hurt, you isolate yourself and you protect yourself. And there's a lot of people that you come in contact with that are protecting themselves. Why? Because pain in our earlier life, listen to this, pain in our earlier years of life teach us how to protect ourselves from pain in our later years of life. And at that point, we will not become vulnerable, will not be transparent, will not be humble, will not be open. And so God does with us like he did with Jacob. He breaks us. You know, my name, when you put it together, it's Brother Ken. But when you spell it out, it's B-R-O-K-E-N, broken. And I've always thought God did that in my life purposely. Because for me to be a blessing, there needs to be brokenness for there to be blessedness. I hope that answered your question. I, I, think, I think, Nathan, one of the things you have to first understand is, is recognize that when people come in, they don't really understand how, they don't necessarily understand what they're protecting themselves from. They want joy, but here's what you need to understand. And, and you see, Nathan, I've lived only in America all my life. And that's not a great thing, always. Because in America, we don't do pain and we don't like to do pain. And we have a lot of ways to get ourselves out of pain. And sometimes the prosperity of Americans and the prosperity of what we've done and blessed, and all of us are blessed by the way, but, but that can be a deterrent. So when a person comes in to your office or comes in to talk to you, just understand this. They don't totally know why, what they're dealing with totally. And you don't have to be a, a mind reader but if you'll listen long enough, here's what you'll hear. You'll hear some pain coming through in their life. Understand this, though. God doesn't give us joy to replace pain. God gives us joy to support us through pain. And so the ultimate goal here is not joy. The ultimate pain, or the ultimate goal here is God's presence and God's presence in our life. So when that person walks into you and they talk to you, and, and you, have to, you have to listen with your ears and also listen with your heart because they, they don't necessarily know, but they're going to take you someplace. They're going to take you someplace in their conversation and they're going to push against you in some places they don't want you to go. They may say, th they may say something like this, Nathan, my dad's the greatest guy and my mom's wonderful. And, and you're thinking, now, why are you telling me that? Why, why, I didn't even ask about your dad. Why are you bringing up questions about your dad? Because see, listen to me, he's living maybe, or she's living some with some disappointment. And you see, 
they don't want you to believe what they believe. And they really believe if they ever give up the hope. You see, we can live with a lot of things, Nathan, but we can't live without hope. And so sometimes we don't really know how our sin has affected us or how other people's sin has affected us. So you have to just listen. Think about, just draw that iceberg in your mind and think, okay, they're going to talk to me about their their beliefs and they're going to talk to me about what they their actions and they're going to talk to me about what they feel. That's fine. But you always want to go a little deeper. You want to say, well, tell me about that. Why? Was that painful? Why was that painful? Has anything else happened that made you think like that? And as you begin to do that, you begin to understand God's word starts coming and that's where you can start start but you see people don't care how much you know nathan until they know how much you care and sometimes you just listen sometimes it's that listening two ears and one mouth listen twice as much as you talk and you say hey talk to me but understand even behind smiles they're smiling because it's too painful they'll start crying and that's okay and sometimes it takes a while for them to work through it but they'll get there the reason they came to you is because they wanted somebody to talk to them, uh, talk to them about that pain, even when they don't know how to talk about it. You've got to know how to talk about it. Blessed are the balanced and your life needs to be balanced, but maybe the greatest counsel I could give you, my brother, would be this. Jesus Christ has a bride. And it's his church, the church you serve in, the people you serve. And you have a bride. So listen to me carefully. You go home and take care of your bride. Jesus will take care of his bride. So sometimes you have to understand that the priorities of the balance is that if you're always available, you're not worth much when you are available. And your family is, the, is your greatest testimony. What should a prophet, a preacher, if he gained the whole church and lose his own family? Well, I, it didn't go exactly like that, did it? Jesus said, what should a prophet, a man, if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? But you and I both know what he meant by that. And so let me just say this to you. You will always have that balance of when I spend time with kids, when I spend time with my wife, and when I spend time with everybody else's kids. But you're not doing your kids any good and a blessing to your children or your wife if you're always with them and you're not with them. You, you want them to say, my dad is the real deal. And my dad knew that home was the most important. And, and you, you spend time with that wife because she's the one that's got, she keeps the fire going in your heart and in your home. And she is also the one that gives you wisdom. She's the one that'll give you counsel. But listen, if you neglect her, her heart will get cold. And ministry is not fun if you lose your family. So let me beg you, don't, don't lose your family. Don't lose your family.